Here we will look at an important concept in machine learning, end-to-end -end learning. In particular, we will look at the idea of encoders and decoders, of an encoder producing an intermediate form that then a decoder transforms into an output, and how this can help us with very complex NLP tasks. For example, machine translation. So let's say you want to make a some computer program that does the following. It takes a sentence in English, like I am a student, and gives you as an output a sentence in Spanish. Soy estudiante. How would you do this? This is obviously an incredibly difficult task. It's difficult for many reasons. As we saw in week two, English has many rules. Spanish has many rules. In week one, we were trying to do a chatbot in Spanish and even a few basic answers made for very complex rules. So both of them have a lot of rules. Both of them have a lot of words. So if we wanted to do like a dictionary for English and a dictionary for Spanish so that we could do matching, it would be a good idea to start with like I in English is the equivalent of yo in Spanish. Student in English is the equivalent of estudiante in Spanish. Pretty soon, you'd run into a problem. And not just a problem that this, ta that this table would be really large. The main problem is that the input and the output don't really match. The input and the output are not one to one in their relationship. For example, in English, we have two tokens for I am. And these are just one token in Spanish, soy. Same for a student, which is two tokens in English, estudiante, which is one token in Spanish. So we have four tokens in the English input and two in the Spanish output. How uh, could we map this relationship? Because if the relationship is not one to one, it's essentially n to n, where you can have n elements in the English that correspond to n elements in Spanish. Sometimes it's two to one, sometimes it's one to two. And so making a huge list of correspondences where you have I am a soy, but also am a soy, and then one of these for every like 60 forms of every Spanish verb forever, trying to do a machine translation like this would be a Sisyphean task. You uh, never end. And we saw in, in week two why theoretically you would never end. People tried at first. Uh, this beautiful punched cart is an example from the first machine translation program in the 1950s developed by IBM. And you can read the story of it in the lower left. This beautiful system takes Russian sentences and translates them into English. For example, uh, in Russian, and you can see the transcription at the top of the punched card, is transformed into the quality of coal is determined by calorie, by calorie content in English. So this program uh, was very small. It had a vocabulary of about 250 words and it could translate about 49 sentences from Russian to English. And it was made so that uh, people could translate scientific papers in Russian to English. And as you can see, in it, there's a short description of how it works. It works with a stored dictionary and operational syntactic programs. So in theory, you could have a system that just has a list of, in one language corresponding to a list in the other one. For example, hello in English corresponds to hola in Spanish. Kachestva uh, in Russian corresponds to quality in English. So this system does that, and it also uses operational syntactic programs, which is really what we saw in week one. It uses replacements to uh, try to figure out the order of words. And again, as we saw in weeks one or two, and two, this would be difficult at best, in, uh, endless in the worst of cases. And again, um, 
The main challenge here is that the sequence the sequences have different lengths and it's very difficult to map the correspondences between the input and the output. So yes, in many cases, the word I corresponds to the French je and M corresponds to suis. But sometimes a student will correspond to étudiant and a student will correspond to un étudiant in French, for example. To make things worse, not only can things be in an end-to-end -end relationship, you need you, they can be uh, shifted around so that you could have different orderings of the elements. For example, if you wanted to translate the English sentence, what are you doing today, into the Mandarin, 今天你在做什么? You would need to not only get the words, but shift them around so that you can get the right order in Mandarin. The word what in English appears as the first element, but it will now be the last element in the Mandarin sentence. The word today is the last one in English, but it's the first one in Mandarin. The word doing in English corresponds to two elements in Mandarin, and the word are in English corresponds to no element in Mandarin. So you have mappings that are one to zero, one to two, and you need to learn those, but you also need to learn how you would shift everything. And again, it would take you forever to try to do this with rules. What if the computer learned it for us? And this is where our deep learning is going to step in. Um, by the way, it, this was hinted even in the 1950s that maybe the solution was to create some sort of, it's some sort of own binary language. What if you could take the English phrase, transform it into some intermediate representation, and then train a neural network to transform the intermediate representation into an output in another language. So your translation would have three stages. For example, you encode English into an intermediate representation, which is a vector, and then you decode this vector into the final representation in the destination language. Essentially, this, mo this model is called encoder decoder, and it is the backbone of many state-of-the-art um, deep learning systems for natural language processing. So this is a very simple diagram of how it would work. We have here RNNs, recurrent neural networks, and what they would do is, for example, take a French sequence like je suis étudiant and encode a vector out of them, which is passed to the decoder. So if you remember from the recurrent neural networks we saw before, you get an input like je, and this input will produce two outputs, some word and, uh, for example, the next word in the sequence, and it will produce a second output, which will be an H or hidden state. This second output will go back into the cycle. So je produces a hidden output, which goes with sui, and then produces another hidden, and then goes with étudiant, and then produces another hidden state. This final H output of the final RNN is the intermediate state. And within it, we would have the encoding of the fact that you had a word like je in the preceding input. You had a word like sui and you had a word like étudiant. So this intermediate form, the, the output of the last recurrent neural network, would contain information about the words that it saw in the encoding stage. It would contain information about je, sui, and étudiant. This would be one neural network. And then we'll train a second neural network, the decoder, to have the hidden uh, state the hidden the hidden output from the recurrent neural network as its input. I'm gonna wait for it to show up. So we have the last hidden output of the recurrent neural network as the input, and then the recurrent neural network will generate an output. It would generate one word in English, and then another word in English, and then another word in English, like a sequence. This method again is called encoder decoder, and it transforms this, the French into an intermediate stage. And then the neural net, the second neural network transforms that intermediate stage into English. So there's again two neural networks here. The first one, the encoder, that takes an input 
and produces an output which we will ignore here. The most important part is the secondary output, the hidden out, uh, state that is transferred in between iterations of the recurrent neural network. So this H state will contain information about the input and then we will use it as the input to train a different neural network to produce the decoded outputs. This has the advantage that we now don't have an, an, an exact one-to-one -one dependency. We can generate as many elements as we need in the decoder, and we can encode as many elements as we need in the encoder. And of course, the way you train these is by having a list of parallel translations. So you have uh, an encoded, I'm sorry, so you have uh, sentences in English and French, and you'll use the English ones to train the encoder and the French ones to train the decoder. This architecture is incredibly flexible. So you, uh, within the, en the encoder and the decoder, you can use a recurrent neural network, for example. You can use an LSTM, as we have here, with its uh, cell states and its H states. You can use other types of uh, neural networks. Remember that, by the way, we see them here in their unfolded state, like unfolded in time. In reality, it's just one neural network to generate the encoder, which keeps feeding itself, and one in the output, which keeps feeding itself. Because we can get, take any encode any sequence and decode any sequence, this opens up a world of possibilities. So instead of English and French, we could have questions and answers, and then train a system where we ask something and we uh, we ask a question encode it and then we decode it as its answer and the training set would be the question and the answer we could also use this for chatbots where we encode a question that the chatbot would get and then decode the answer that the chatbot would produce we could have really cool stuff for example we could encode a wikipedia article and we could decode its summary. And the training set would be the article and the summary. By doing this, we would have a neural summarization program. Again, where you take some large document as the input, encode it, and then decode it as the summary. You could even do multimodal uh, sequences. You could have, for example, a picture as the encoded element and uh, a description of the picture as the decoded element. So you could take, for example, the grayscale representation of a picture with zebras in it, encode it, and then produce the decoding a herd of zebras are walking in a field. And of course, the training set would be pictures matched with the descriptions. You could have the computer convert natural language into computer language. So let's say you have a home assistant and you tell it, play a song from the Beatles. The computer could encode the English sentence and decode it as computer instructions so that it would select a random song and then play the random song, for example. This is, if, if you want to read it, this is an example from, this was published in February, of a, uh, a multimodal model. And by the way, I'm not sure I mentioned this. We call these sequence to sequence uh, architectures because you take a sequence in and you decode a sequence out. So it's a sequence of elements as the input and a sequence of elements as the output. Words in a question, words in an answer, words in a Wikipedia article, words in a summary. This is called sequence to sequence. And there's, for example, um, sequence to sequence models that can take more than one input and encode it together. For example, this paper uh, takes video, audio, and comments for the video and encodes them all together. And then the decoding is comments for the video. So you take a video like that unicorn carrying dumplings and the audio and the comments that were produced for it before and code that in a huge vector 
and then decode it as new comments, like um, a soup dumpling that fell on the ground, or, or fed two stray dogs, or I haven't eaten soup dumplings for a long time. There's the paper if you want to check it out. So as you can see, sequence-to-sequence -sequence models are incredibly flexible and powerful in how we can use them. And they have a, a few very cool consequences. The most important of which is that we don't need uh, high-level features anymore. So over the last few weeks, we've been wondering what kind of features can we extract so that we can explain our data. For example, when we looked at support vector machines, we were very worried at, uh, about bigrams and, and, and unigrams, and we were trying to figure out what the best features were. The truth is, extracting features is always difficult. Uh, it's time consuming, but particularly features are very brittle in that your final results are going to depend a lot on what features you chose first. Um, sequence to sequence models take a different approach. They take in raw data, for example, raw text, and produced, produce uh, raw text as their output. Because they take text directly and produce output directly, somewhere in the middle, the computer is learning the high level features. The computer is extracting the information that it needs to encode it, and then it's learning to decode it properly. Because it is uh, thinking about the features itself, and we are not extracting the features, the computer is trying to detect what are the features that matter, um, we call this end-to-end -end learning, where we only provided low-level uh, raw for example, text and get text, and the computer does the learning along the way, end to end. And this is another reason why this is called deep learning, because the computer is trying to find the patterns that matter instead of having us tell it what are the patterns that matter. As a summary of this, in tasks like machine translation, um, we need to make connections between sequences, like I'm a student, soy estudiante, these sequences can be scrambled in between the input and the output. They can have end-to-end -end, uh, correspondences. And because of this, it will be very difficult to draw some, um, an algorithm that just takes one element and input and produces one element that corresponds to the output. It would be better if we could produce a vector that represents all of the input as an intermediate form. We encode it as an intermediate form, and then we decode it into our output. We call this a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, and this architecture is encoder-decoder. Uh, this allows a lot of flexibility where you can have a Wikipedia article and its summary, or questions and answers, or uh, re natural language requests and computer programming instructions. By, doing, by having this kind of architecture, you can have tons of inputs and outputs, but most importantly, the computer will be doing most of the learning. It will find what is it about the input that needs to be encoded and then what is it about it that needs to be decoded as the output. It'll be doing a lot of the learning itself and we call this end-to-end -end learning. In the next video, we're going to look at how it figures out what parts of the input and the output it should pay attention to. We call this attention.